Our presenters today are Ricardo Costa and Peter Patterson. Ricardo is our Chief Information Officer at Perlater. Ricardo is responsible for the organization's IT and data capabilities and across innovation across various lines of business and is leading Perlater's blockchain involvement. Ricardo's past positions include CIO of Western Foods and Head of Information Security for Rogers. Peter Patterson, on my right, is uh, a blockchain leader at IBM. He brings extensive knowledge in blockchain, API economy, Internet of Things and analytics. He helps companies engage with digital transformation and address emerging trends in technology. Thank you for joining us today, gentlemen. I'm going to pass the mic across to uh, Ricardo, I'm sorry, to Peter, uh, and to uh, walk through uh, the first step, which will be what is blockchain. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Dave. Um, Thank you, Ricardo. Pleasure to be here. I was good to talk to Ricardo about blockchain. Um, so, what we're going to, or what I'm going to do, is take you through a bit of a one-on-one on blockchain, have a slightly different perspective on blockchain versus maybe some of the hype that you hear about blockchain in the press, right? Because, you know, if you're like me, you read these articles and you probably come away from them thinking, or maybe more confused than even when you started, because they tell you how blockchain is going to change the world, but not exactly how. We take a slightly more pragmatic view and approach to blockchain uh, in, in the IBM world. And uh, we certainly learn every day um, with folks like Ricardo and uh, Purolator and uh, improve on, um, on that position every single day. So it's really joint collaborative effort. Um, so again, thanks very much for inviting me. So here's one really key fundamental concept that I always like groups to take away when we talk about blockchain. It's this idea of a business network, right? because businesses never operate in isolation. They, they act as participants in business networks. And business networks connect customers, suppliers, banks, regulators. Um, they cross regulatory boundaries. They cross geographical boundaries. And across this business network, we generate wealth as goods and, moves, and, goods and services flow, right? So as goods and services move across the network, wealth is generated. And this is what we kind of loosely refer to as a market. But the growth of wealth can be constrained if the network is heavily siloed or inefficient. So this is one of the big things that we're addressing with blockchain, right? Breaking down those silos by elevating the level of trust amongst participants in the business network. Um, I always like to say, if you had complete transparency throughout your business network, what could you achieve? Or throughout your supply chain, what could you achieve? And we're going to touch a lot on that topic. But let's just move along to sort of the definition of assets, right? So what is being transferred across business networks? Because, you know, certainly cash is the first thing you think about, right? Financial value, but um, it, it goes much deeper than that. And really one of the interesting places that I'm exploring a lot these days is alternate forms of value that transfer across the networks. Um, we're, we're talking specifically about supply chain today, but um, we'll probably raise a few concepts that go beyond the idea of just cash. Um, when you think about the types of assets, then we're two kind of fundamental buckets or categories that we can put them into. So you have um, tangible assets. So things like a house or a car would be a tangible asset, right? But then there are intangible assets too. So that house and the mortgage that goes along with it, the mortgage is the intangible asset. Um, the lease on a car is an intangible asset. And what's really interesting about intangible assets is that you can subdivide them. And again, very prime for sort of uh, capability of the blockchain provides to do interesting things with those types of concepts. Um, quick note on intangible in assets, right? We don't want to forget about things like um, intellectual property, patents, uh, other types of digital assets, music, games, video, even art, anything that you can digitize can be an asset available to be transferred on blockchain. So what's really key to this transfer of value across blockchain? Well, ledgers are key, right? So how we record those, that ownership of those transactions, the transfer of those transactions. And the thing is, ledgers certainly aren't new. Double entry bookkeeping has been around since the 14th century. Really what we're doing is just updating this idea of, um, of double entry bookkeeping. So let, let me give you a quick example. So if I have a car, and, you know, sort of low value to this car. If I drive a 2008 Toyota Yaris and Ricardo wants to buy that car from me, he gives me money. I give him the keys to the car and we probably write in our own books, keeping our own set of books for all of the assets that we own. 
So I write that off of my set of books, and Ricardo writes that onto his set of books. Probably sufficient for that type of a transaction, right? But what if it's not, you know, just a 2008 Yaris? What if it's a Ferrari? Because Ricardo really likes Ferraris. So very high value. We, we might actually say to Dave, Dave, you take this money because it's a lot of money now. You hold on to it. And I'm not going to transfer ownership until Ricardo gets the car and he actually turns the key and it works, right? So Dave is an intermediary in that transaction. He's holding the money. And he's potentially holding the paper. What we've also kind of described there is a contract, right? So that ownership only changes if the car starts and Ricardo gets to drive it away. So there's a contract governing how that transaction occurs, and there's an intermediary in that transaction who's holding money or the paper. So if we kind of think about this now from a blockchain perspective, how that could potentially change, um, what if we just shared the same ledger, or at least we updated one ledger that both Ricardo and I could see with some of the other with some of the other technologies surrounding blockchain, we have the potential then to also potentially not have it as an intermediary in that network because we have some trust in the system that's not going to allow us to make that exchange until the contractual conditions have been uh, met. So if, if you kind of look at the slide that's up on the screen now, this describes the scenario, um, the, the sort of before case in that scenario. And, and let's kind of extrapolate a little bit more to a real world um, situation, right? So, so we're, we're talking about, you know, a supply chain here and all of the participants in a supply chain and all of the point to point communications that go on within that supply chain, right? So you can see all of the different participants, the potential intermediaries, the auditors of the records, everybody, <clears throat> Pardon me. Everybody is recording those transactions on their own set of books. And at some point in time, there needs to be a reconciliation process. Maybe at the end of the month, people, different parties in the network get together and they make sure that all of the accounting matches and so on. So you can clearly see a number of inefficiencies in this scenario, right? As each participant keeps their own ledger and they're updated to represent business transactions as they occur becomes expensive to do this. There's a lot of duplication of effort happening. Um, and a lot of intermediaries potentially adding margin for services. And the other thing to note here too, we talked about Ricardo and I having a contract um, when he's buying my Ferrari. Well, every time in this more complex network, there are contractual conditions for a transaction to, to occur. Those, those are reviewed, those are executed by each of the parties in the network. So again, terribly inefficient, right? So this is what we're really aiming to tackle with blockchain. So if we look at the after picture, um, this is the novel blockchain architecture that everyone is talking about, right? So a shared replicated permission ledger. Um, this gives people the ability to share a ledger that's updated every time a transaction occurs through peer-to-peer peer-to-peer um, -peer replication, right? So now in near real time, everybody has the latest information available to them. And, you know, as we get into the supply, more specific supply chain examples uh, moving forward, um, you can imagine how that potentially um, affects you when you're moving either financial transactions or things like perishable goods and services. Really, really important to know. So how does this work? Cryptography is used to ensure that network participants see only the parts of the ledger that are relevant to them, right? And that the tr transactions are secure, authenticated, and verifiable. So just a quick pause to reiterate on that part. You only see in this network, so this is a private permissioned network, right? We know all of the participants that are in the network. It's not a public blockchain network where anyone can potentially join. So we know the participants on the network, but we also, only give them access to the parts of the ledger that they should see, right? So um, if you're a supplier and you have customers A, B, and C, you might not want customer A to see the, um, the uh, contracts that you have with supplier B or with customer B, right? So it's very key, very fundamental, but, but very key. So you only see the parts of the ledger that you should see. Um, 
And the other thing is, so blockchain, so it allows for the contract of the asset transfer to be embedded in the transaction database, which is actually part of the fabric. So what I mean here is those contracts or what another buzzword you'll hear about blockchain, those smart contracts, they're actually part of the technology, right? So if you don't meet the contractual obligations in the smart contract, you're not going to add a new block of information to the ledger. Right. So really, really key point here. And by the way, you might hear me refer to smart contracts as chain code. Um, that's a that's a sort of hyperledger thing uh, that, that we uh, interchange a little bit. But so your smart contracts govern your transactions. You need to meet the conditions of the contracts to add a block to the chain. However, how do you do that? So in a public sort of infrastructure, if you're dealing with a public blockchain, you've probably heard of this concept called mining. Right. So all of these people all over the world are plugged into the network and they're mining transactions and they're solving these cryptographic puzzles. And when those are solved, then a new block gets added to the chain. Well, this is a fundamentally different way to do it in a private permission network where you know all of the participants in the network. The, the, the way that we achieve consensus is of those participants in the network, you've gotten together beforehand and you've decided how you will govern your network. And one of those things is how will you achieve consensus? So let's say there are six parties in the network. Well, maybe you need all six to agree that a transaction has met um, the contractual obligations and therefore it's achieved consensus and gets added to the, uh, to the uh, blockchain as a new block. Maybe in some um, certain transactions, only three of six need to participate, or in some transactions, maybe only two of six because you have a different supply agreement within that chain. So we're not going out to the public network and trying to achieve through mining um, consensus. We're actually going within the known participants in the network who have governed this process, and they, um, through the technology, will achieve consensus or not. A couple more really key points. Um, provenance. For Actually, let's talk first of all about immutability. Once you add a block to the network, it's absolutely immutable. You cannot take it away. Now, if you added a block in error or incorrectly, that's fine. You can write a new transaction nullifying that previous, uh, previous um, transaction. However, um, that previous transaction will always appear there forever and ever. And what's really, really important about this, it gives you this idea of provenance, right? So you know where an asset originated, you know how it changed over time, who had ownership of it at any given time. And that, that's going to be really key to what we discussed today moving forward. Um, the other thing that it does, it gives you this concept of finality, right? So there is one place to determine the ownership of an asset or the completion of a transaction. And this is the role of the shared ledger. So just in recap, these, these are the sort of four key parts that we talk about when we talk about a blockchain ledger in the private permission world of Hyperledger Fabric, right? So the ledger itself, append only, right? Immutability gives you that provenance and it's shared and replicated in near real time amongst all the participants in the network. The smart contracts, those those conditions that govern a transaction, how it will occur and whether or not it gets added to your chain. Privacy, that, that cryptographic um, element to blockchain, uh, those set of keys that you get handed when you join a network, making sure not only that the transactions are safe, auditable and so on, but um, also uh, that you only see the parts of the ledger that you should see. And then lastly, proof, how you elevate that level of trust on blockchain, which gives you all of that transparency that is so key. So proof, meaning you, you have this process of consensus where you have solved for uh, consensus within the technology and you've agreed to it based on the governance that you've laid out by the known participants in your network. So I don't want to overcrowd your heads with what blockchain is. Hopefully that's a good foundational piece. Um, and, and then maybe I'll, I'll turn it back over and, and ask us to continue. Perfect. We're just going to launch a quick poll. Thank you so much for doing the introduction. Uh, and before we pass it across to um, Ricardo, we're going to pass a quick poll. And the question that we're asking is, is your com company currently considering uh, blockchain, implementing blockchain technology? And the four options here we have is not considering, exploring conversations, actively planning, or currently implementing. 
Um, and at that, I'm gonna while while you guys answer, and if you have any questions, feel free to pass them along. We will address all well as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. But if you want to send them in in advance, you can do so. Um, so Ricardo, I'll pass it across to you. Thank you. So I didn't know I was buying a Ferrari today, so that's good news too. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about supply chain and 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 the role of blockchain in supply chain. So. Supply chains are becoming increasingly globalized and complex. We have multiple manufacturers, multiple distributors, carriers, different border agreements when we go globally. Uh, the number of transactions and handoffs are actually huge. At a high level, blockchain, the, the biggest potential of blockchain will come from digitalizing and authenticating the flow of goods, services, data across the supply chain, across all the stakeholders. So when you look at uh, some of those complex problems, we have uh, three examples here. Uh, the first one being authenticity, and, and you could look at that as a counterfeit. So unique identifying and verifying authenticity of goods. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, a case where with drugs, with the, uh, the pharmacy industry, tracking, making sure that the drugs are, are not counterfeit is extremely important. From a visibility perspective, understanding the movement of goods in the entire supply chain, keeping in mind that you might have your supply chain might be in different places. A lot of times it's really uh, we have solved the problem for tier one. Most companies on a, through supply chain, they understand the provenance and, and they have visibility to what's coming from the tier one. But when you involve you start involving the vendors of your vendors of your vendors, that becomes a little bit more complex and, and supply chain can help with that. And, and the easiest one that people usually see first is efficiency. So given that supply chains are heavy on interactions and transactions as we go through this globalized and complex uh, uh, world now, blockchain can actually reduce the number of handoffs and help us uh, uh, do the entire supply chain transaction more efficiently. Uh, if you look at the, the one question that everybody asks usually is, should I use blockchain? Blockchain is a buzzword. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. But do I have a problem for blockchain or is it a hammer looking for a nail? So the, the one, there is a lot of ways that you can validate a solution to see if it's applicable or not for a blockchain. One is the one we're presenting on the slide there. It's uh, uh, validating through this five T's. So the idea is if you have uh, a solution or a problem to solve and one of these pillars, only one of the pillars applies to the solution, you can probably solve it with a database or some uh, solution that has been used before. But when you start adding more of those pillars to the problem and you start seeing, hey, more of these pillars actually are part of my problem, blockchain could be the right solution. That's not 100% true all the time, but it's a good uh, pressure test to see if you're just if you just have a problem and blockchain might be the buzzword of the moment or not. So if you look at trust, if your problem needs to validate transactions in an untrusted environment and it's heavily reliable on trusting different parties, that's one potential case for blockchain. If you add traceability, and we were talking about counterfeit before, uh, you need to, to establish the asset, the goods, the services, and the data provenance. That's probably another a good case. You add those two together, uh, uh, it could be a good thing. Track is the most standard one, and we've seen that there's a lot of solutions out there today talking about tracking and blockchain and putting track and trace on blockchain. Uh, if you have to track a record, track a package, track uh, uh, the movement of a, an asset, that's another application for blockchain. So if you start seeing the, these five pillars, if you have a problem that actually needs trust, track and trace, blockchain could be your solution. Tunnel to me is one of the most interesting ones because it's where efficiency comes to play. So how do you simplify transactions between stakeholders? Again, for supply chain, if you think the number of handoffs we do when we're transporting from A to B or, or moving from, from raw materials to a, a baked good, for example, uh, there's a lot of transactions happening there. When you're doing transportation cross-border, there's a lot of handoffs in cross-border between importer, exporter, et cetera. So a tunnel is where you have the blockchain actually dealing with the, the single ledger as a single distributed ledger, as uh, Peter was explaining, and everybody has access to that. And the whole movement of the good goes through a tunnel. Everybody who needs access has that access, and everybody who needs to transact will have the information they need. And transparency, which is probably one of the, the, the biggest benefits that 
come across from a, from a blockchain is the ledger becomes the record of all transactions and everyone that can and should have access to that information will have that access. So it's transparent to everybody. There is trust involved and, and it becomes a, a much more uh, uh, independent and uniform uh, ledger. The going back to the, the concept of the, the five pillars again, if you have some, if you have a problem that would need all five requirements or all five uh, uh, ideas behind those pillars, you probably have a champion for blockchain. So we're going to run through a couple examples here, and, and this might be going back and forth between me and Peter. But the first one is on a medical supply chain. If you think from, from a, a medical supply chain, so let's say a drug manufacturer, they're going to do the research of the drug, they're going to manufacture that drug, and then you're going to have millions and millions of pills. Those pills will be packaged maybe in bottles, and after that, those bottles will be packed in a pallet that will be transported through their entire supply chain. They will be sorted. They will be the pallet will be broken and will be distributed to pharmacies that will go to pharmacy stores and eventually get at the hands of a, of a patient that needs that drug. So there are several points there. If you think on the, on the five pillars, several points there that are important from a counterfeit perspective. If you're tracing the provenance of the drug through the blockchain, you can make sure that that person receiving the drug at the tail end of the supply chain, the consumer, he is actually getting the right drug. It's not a counterfeit. At the same time, you can look at uh, tracking. So from a manufacturing perspective, the manufacturer can actually have full visibility and tracking capabilities to the patient. And even the doctor uh, prescribing the, the drug, if the, the, the process allows for that, if the ecosystem allows for that. So that becomes very powerful because if you have an issue with the drug, you know exactly which patients were actually prescribed that drug, not only prescribe the drug, but actually consume that specific lot that had a problem with the drug. So if you think from a food safety perspective, if you think from a health and safety perspective, that becomes very powerful. Uh, also, when, when the farm, when the distribution is happening, the pharmacies actually have a way to do the track and trace and the visibility is open to everybody. Again, transparency. And again, it becomes a much more powerful view from an analytics perspective, from a, uh, an end to end process for the medical supply chain. If we go to, to a more, uh, uh, Sorry, Ricardo, let me just touch on, on, on the medical supply chain for one second, right? Because I think this one is really, really key. And, and I'm always big on not just social good, but public health and safety and so on. So we have an issue right now with Schedule 2 drugs, right? So opioids. And, and we know this is a problem. And, and by the way, we hear about it a lot in the U.S. media, but we're hearing more and more about it in Canada. So per capita, we're, we're second only behind the U.S. in terms of opioid addiction in this country. So... According to FDA shipping data, right? So this is a U.S. statement, but again, we're, we're not far behind on, especially on a per capita basis. $17 billion worth of, or 423 million opioid painkillers were shipped to West Virginia between 2007 and 2012, right? And West Virginia is, is a state in the U.S. where six of the 55 counties in the state have amongst the highest death, rate, death rates from opioid addiction in the country. So, why were all of these drugs being shipped there? When you talk about transparency throughout the entire chain, certainly there's, you know, commercial benefit there, right? So doing things like just-in-time inventory, um, making sure there's less spoilage, right? Making sure that things make it through the supply chain. Um, but also from a public safety, from a public health perspective, so a town of 400 people called Kermit, West Virginia, received 9 million hydrocodone pills in two years. If we were able to see the entire supply chain end-to-end, if we were able to give a regulatory view to a trusted body to see all of that activity, could we not have prevented this? So we're working on projects to serialize drugs today. Um, this is exactly the types of things that we're trying to tackle with this, uh, with this type of a technology. So thanks. I thought that was important to share. So thank you. Appreciate that. So. Uh, another example, and, and it, again, it's a similar example, but now a different industry, but we want to show the cross-border spin, and that to us is something that becomes very exciting. Uh, 
uh, from, let's say, from a technology supply chain, somebody's building the parts or the phone or the technical device on one side, that goes through the same process of distribution packaging. And somebody at the tail end of the supply chain is actually buying that from an e-commerce store. So let's say uh, Peter is buying a part for his Ferrari here that I'm buying next week. Uh, his Ferrari, he's buying a part coming from the States. So that part is going to come through the supply chain. Uh, he's going to, he can, the supply, the, the blockchain network can actually provide visibility to the supplier, to the distributor, to the, the transportation company, to the retailer, all the way to Peter in that sense. So from a tracking perspective, it's a very strong solution. From a tracing perspective, given that some of the technology components that people are shipping, you need to make sure it's not counterfeit, et cetera, et cetera. You can actually know the provenance of the product. But also when you're crossing border, that's where things start getting interesting. And it comes the tunnel play. So the amount of handoffs and transactions between uh, uh, export and import when you're crossing a border is humongous because you have freight forwarders, you have brokers, you have the, the agencies from one side of the border, from the other side of the border. Sometimes you're actually transporting with one company on one side of the border and, and another company on the other side of the border, and the last mile might be performed by a third party. So the whole, the whole cross-border piece becomes very complicated and complex because of the number of information and, and assets flowing through the border. Through blockchain, you can actually simplify the whole thing. So the minute something is being shipped by uh, the manufacturer, the border agents, for example, could actually know what's coming in their way, which truck it is, which pallet in that truck it is, and they can probably do the clearance before the package even crosses the border. Uh, at the same time, the visit, it's transparent to everybody. Everybody knows what's happening. And the most important thing is you need the trust because you have too many players working in the same environment. So from a, a, a supply chain cross-border uh, play, we see a lot of benefits and a lot of uh, potential of using blockchain to solve some of those problems. I don't know if you want to add anything, Peter. So, so to, your, to your point, Ricardo, so <clears throat> the World Trade Organization estimates that wholesale trade digitization, right? So we're talking about, you know, the, the sort of deep trade digitization across the globe, but wholesale trade digitization could increase worldwide GDP by 5% and total trade volumes by 15%. So you recall back to, you know, some of those opening 101 points on blockchain. And we're talking about breaking down silos so that we don't constrain the growth of wealth. What you're talking about is exactly that, right? So more flow of goods and services through markets. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve. And by digitizing that process, that's how we get there. There are lots, lots of tangential benefits to that as well, working with some governments who are setting up special economic zones, for example, who need to monitor the flow of goods and services into and out of territories because participating in these specific territories or special zones gets you certain benefits. So you need to know what comes in and what goes out and how it's manufactured and, you know, what the part components are. I, and personally, I find it very interesting, the role that Purolator potentially plays in that whole scenario moving forward. So um, that's it for now, but that's that's a topic we could talk about for a long time, I'm sure. So now uh, uh, that's all great. We have the one-on-one on. -one on uh, sorry, I think we have a, a poll. Yeah, let's run a quick poll, guys. Uh, so I can give you the results <clears throat> from the last poll. Um, so on the last poll we ran, uh, is your com company considering blockchain? We had a 45% uh, uh, the, uh, the participants that are not considering. 44% are in exploratory conversations. 8% are actively planning, and 3% are currently implementing. So. That's kind of where we're at in terms of current state. Um, and uh, we're going to run a second poll. And what the second poll's question is, what would be the primary reason for your company to adopt uh, blockchain technology? Um, and we've, we've aligned that with uh, the uh, trust tracking, tracing, tunnel, and transparency. So, uh, and we'll give it a couple seconds there for you guys to filter in your answers. Thank you so much for your participation. So, so, uh, uh, uh so what, what's next, right? So we understand the concepts of blockchain. Uh, there are some cases here on supply chain, et cetera. So things to think about moving forward, and this is our view. Of course, there's a lot of views around this. But I think the number one thing is blockchain is a buzzword today. 
uh, everybody's talking about it, everybody has a product on blockchain or some different uh, spin on blockchain. Uh, the real thing now to me is we got to understand the hype. Us as a distributor or any company in the supply chain, we need to understand what the hype is, understand the good things about blockchain, what's really true about, about blockchain, how you can implement it. Uh, but we also got to implement what blockchain is not for. There's a lot of solutions out there that we could probably uh, uh, do something else with that, and use something else or even a regular database to solve the problem. So understanding the hype is really important. Uh, then it's validating the potential. And, and a few things here to call out on that is one of the biggest challenges on blockchain, in my view, is governance. You're adding a lot of different players in, in, in the blockchain. And so who owns what? Who is accountable for what? And, and what is the governance setup for that? So if you're going to engage on a blockchain that has multiple stakeholders, that's probably one of the most important things you got to think about is how you're going to manage that as an ecosystem. Uh, the other thing is making sure that the processes, understand the processes you have, because technology is great, but what we usually say is technology usually doesn't come before the process. So understand if the process is actually uh, uh, can be enabled by blockchain, can be supported by blockchain, because a lot of times the process might not even support that. So it's understanding the viability in your ecosystem of that process. The other one is the ecosystem, and we touched a little bit of that in the governance, but the ecosystem is, uh, it's making sure that, again, you have multiple players. It's not supposed to address the objective of one company. So if I'm creating a blockchain uh, network that's only uh, uh, being accountable for, it's only addressing a pure later need, it's really not a network, it's not It's not an ecosystem. So it's making sure that those things are are, are addressed and, and analyzed before you jump on the bandwagon of blockchain. And the last one is the technology implications. Uh, we talk a lot about everybody in IT, it's, it's, it's not a buzzword, it's a reality. Everybody talks about legacy. So how does blockchain actually uh, enable your infrastructure, but what are the risks of your infrastructure in that blockchain? And how, comple how more complex you're gonna make your, uh, uh, your systems or your architecture and how much is that actually driving value? A lot of times, and I'm, I've been having a lot of conversations around that, I see people jumping into the bandwagon of, of blockchain without looking into the uh, uh, cost implications that they might have on their legacy infrastructure just because of that. Uh, the third piece that I wanna talk about is, and, and I, I was happy to see that there is 40, 48, 45% of people actually looking at exploring, because that's collaborate. It's start exploring it. It's start talking to different companies. Purolator recently joined the Blockchain and Transport Alliance, and that's the whole intent of it, is collaborating, talking to peers, discussing, understanding what's going on, helping us understand the hype, and us helping some people understand the hype, trying to understand where it's applicable and where it's not, but it can't be something done in isolation. Collaboration is extremely important on this. And the fourth one, uh, if you're not too risk averse, uh, try it out, test it, do some proof of concepts and see some companies are gonna fail. Some companies are not gonna fail. So it's, it's there, are, there, are proof, there are cases there that can be done. Uh, I do a lot of comparisons with uh, the hype on the internet a few, uh, several years ago, where if you look at the internet when it started, it was pretty much uh, replacing the yellow pages. So people were just using to provide the information that were in the yellow pages on the on the web. And if you look at now, different business models popped up. So a lot of things that are happening today, you see a lot of business cases and a lot of people trying blockchain on, on current models and models that we already have, and that's okay. But in the future, what I expect is actually new business models and new uh, different things happening because of blockchain. Uh, I. Yeah, so thank you guys so much. We're gonna roll into a couple questions and uh, run our last poll prior to doing that. So if you guys have any questions, we've got a lot coming through right now, but feel free to put them in. Just to give you the results from the last poll, 12% uh, of you guys identified trust as uh, the primary reason, 45% uh, identified tracking, 16% identified tracing, 6 identified, 6% uh, 6 identified tunnel, and 20% identified uh, transparency. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, 
So we're going to ask the last question here, and the last question is, what is the primary, uh, what is the primary barrier to you um, considering blockchain technology? So the options we've provided are state of the technology, knowledge and skill sets, too high a cost, no identified benefit, um, or if you have any other reason that fits outside of those four categories. Lots of answers coming in. Thank you guys so much. Um, and send those questions in. And while we're doing that final poll, we're going to take our first question, which uh, came in, and this question's for, it looks like, Ricardo. And from a blockchain perspective, perspective, how do you see Perlator playing a role in the supply chain? So if we if we look at the even the, the picture that we showed before, uh, from an end-to-end -end perspective, we we can be engaged from, from the, the first, transportation or distribution of the, the manufacturing good, for example, all the way to the last mile. So at the end of the day, the way we see it, if you're doing track and trace, if you're putting something on a truck and you're managing that through blockchain, uh, we should be part of it. We should be in some way or form uh, either joining a blockchain network or enabling a blockchain network or being part of that, of that uh, uh, movement of package or package movement. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we joined the Blockchain and Transport Association is helping us define what standards are going to be around for blockchain and transportation. How can we actually create those networks and, and be part of the creation of those networks? So going back to the question, from an end-to-end -end view, we can be involved in multiple parts through cross-border, through uh, first mile, middle mile, last mile, and, and everything in between. Perfect. We're going to take another question here. Uh, this question is for Peter. Peter, how do you see, uh, so how can cryptocurrencies play a role in these types of blockchain initiatives as agrees to reduce friction in the payment process? That's a great question. Um, so I positioned IBM. So let, let me just really clarify one thing first. Hyperledger Fabric, which is what IBM implements blockchain projects on. There are others too, but primarily Hyperledger Fabric is not an IBM product. It's an open source product. Kind of Genesis was with IBM, but we worked with the Linux Foundation to open source it. So anybody can go and download a copy of it um, and, and play with it and so on. But there's no inherent notion of cryptocurrency within that fabric structure, right? Um, but that's not to say that there isn't a place for crypto. So I have some challenges with crypto primarily because it's in um, a public blockchain infrastructure. And, and again, not to say public blockchains are bad, right? There's some really great innovation going on there. Love how democratized it is and the ability for anyone to kind of contribute good ideas. So that's amazing. But I think there's some things that need to be worked out, uh, including, you know, um, some of the environmental challenges around, you know, mining and what happens there, the cost of transactions and, and frankly, the thing, one of the big challenges with crypto is to mine those transactions to validate an actual exchange of value takes time, right? And I know there are some ways to kind of speed that up, but fundamentally speaking, the, the market that we serve are enterprises and we need to kind of do these things very, very quickly. So on Fabric, we're getting, you know, transaction speeds in the thousands per second, you know, versus the tens in the, on the public side. Um, so don't throw rocks at me, public guys, because I, I love what you're doing, and let's, I'm sure they're going to work together. So that brings me to, to how I'll answer this question. There is a place for crypto, absolutely. So, you know, it, even if it's more so a settlement token of some sort or another, the market mechanism around whether that gains value, loses value out in the market and so on, it's so erratic right now. And, and I've worked with, you know, the regulators here and, and had lots of discussions with people who actually – are, are charged with taking care of our economy, right? Guarding on systemic risk. It, it's too volatile right now to do it. We saw what happened to Bitcoin, for example, before Christmas, it ran up to 20 grand and by that midpoint of January, it's probably down to nine. There's a lot of volatility in that system right now. We have actually partnered with a company called Stellar, um, uh, not dissimilar to the Ripple network. And we have um, we have a crypto, I'm using air quotes, a crypto type solution for cross border money movement, right? So cross border transactions. And it's based on, you know, a settlement token and the FX, so this, that smart contracting concept that we talked about. Think about applying that to FX markets and the ability to not only um, execute on those when you're moving money cross borders, but to do it in near real time, right? So you're not losing out on those exchange rates and so on. So that's one example where crypto can play. But if you think about, you know, what Ricardo is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, moving things throughout a supply chain, crossing borders, doing all of those sorts of things, 
could you potentially settle transactions quicker using some sort of a coin or a token to do so? Yep. What are you going to back it with? And I think we need to maybe think about that a little bit more before it's in broad scale use or application within, you know, the sort of enterprise market that we at least at IBM have chosen to address. Um, but, you know, hopefully it's a very long winded answer. But the answer is, yeah, crypto does play. I think it's going to take a little bit of time before we weave it in. And I might recommend that if you are an enterprise, primarily looking at the underlying technology of blockchain as opposed to crypto, because remember, Bitcoin is an implementation of blockchain. It's not blockchain itself. So look at the underlying foundation of what blockchain can do for your business. And at some point in time, crypto probably plays in settlements. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, we got. An, I just want to update you guys on the polls. So the results came back in. What is the primary barrier? Um, so primary barrier to blockchain adoption looks like 18 percent of you guys said state of the technology reflecting what Peter's just identified. 42% of you guys said uh, knowledge and skill sets. Third uh, was too high a cost at 8%, and 21% of you said no identified benefit, uh, and with the remaining on other. Uh, which leads us to our next question, which kind of actually um, fits very well with this, and that is, uh, we'll put this one across to Ricardo. Ricardo, do you, uh, so this is pretty basic, do you purchase blockchain software, or how do you get started? So uh, that's a great question, because and, and, and this is my experience in the last three or four months in just exploring blockchain and, and talking about blockchain. You, can you purchase blockchain today? Probably. And there will probably be hundreds of vendors telling you that they have a blockchain solution for you. Uh, is that the right thing to do? I'll be candid and honest. I don't know. Maybe it solves a problem you have. But I think that the main thing that we need to keep in mind is uh, it is a buzzword. Everybody's trying to jump on it. And a lot of times it feels like it's a solution looking for problems. And I, I, I like looking first at what is the problem we have, and then you see if blockchain is a solution or not. And then you can figure out, is this something that I can buy off the shelf, or is this something that I actually need to create? Most of the things I have seen uh, uh, at this point is there are a lot of solutions out there that are solving old problems that we had before, uh, and they might not be the right thing for blockchain. And, and I think the power right now is actually coming up with creative ways of uh, developing your own blockchain. As Peter was saying, it's there's a lot of open source stuff out there. There's a lot of stuff that you can actually try it out on your own and do your own proof of concept and, and, and partner. Partner with the right people. The right And it's not only the right vendors, it's the right peers, the right clients, the, the right people in your supply chain, because then you can solve problems together. And if it's an off the shelf or, or something you need to build, if you have the business case behind it, it's it becomes a powerful proposition. Perfect. Yeah. Va validate, validate, validate business cases. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to pass. Uh, this will probably be the last question or second last question. So if you guys do have any additional questions you want to send in, um, please send them in, and we will either get back to them immediately or we'll try to follow up with you. Uh, if you have particular inquiries, don't uh, hesitate. Uh, there's an email provided in the uh, invitation and confirmation email. Uh, that's my email, david.bustle at perlator.com. You can reach out and I can facilitate or drive any, any information you need your way. Uh, the last question we got here, uh, or potentially the second last, is uh, I guess we'll direct this at Peter. Peter, do you see a role for blockchain in the export supply chain of bulk commodities? I uh, Example, uh, coal, potash, ex UTC. Yeah, that's a um, really neat question. Didn't expect to get that one. Um, we're working on that. Um, so, again, I don't answer anything quickly. So just, you know, cut me off if I'm going too long there, David. But um, so we're working on a really neat project right now around non-GMO IP soy. Um, and, and what, so I never thought I'd know this much about non-GMO IP soy, but um the thing is, uh, for, for commodities um, and export markets in particular, so we think about IP soy, you know, um, a lot of the Asian markets are, are kind of the primary targets, right? So, uh, and, and they're larger than you might think. So what we have done and where we've chosen to focus in this particular project is on, you know, two things, differentiating. Well, one thing particularly, differentiating uh, to, to world markets, to global markets, right? So if we were able in this particular case to track the provenance, right, from um, farm to fork of uh, non-GMO IP soy, so guarantee, first of all, that it's non-GMO, secondly, that it's IP protected, um, 
would people in markets pay more for that? Would they consume more? Would we get more volumes or would we get more share? And that's what our business case is telling us to pursue. So that's what we're doing. And we're targeting certain markets overseas. And we're going to see whether or not um, the fact that we certify and verify, you know, essentially think of this IP soy coming with a little name tag attached to it and a barcode. You scan it and it tells you exactly where it came from, where it was born. Um, will that move the needle, right? Because if the market size is big enough, those little moves of the needle result in big value right then the second place is um, you know potentially is uh, will sustainability help di differentiate there too so is this sustainably grown it's not just that it follows the non-gmo standards and the IP um, standards but were, were crops rotated um, properly um, was the seed certified uh, and and so on so a number of things um, in in that area as well which we believe will differentiate the product on global markets and help us capture more share for the people participating in this project, right? So a very diverse group um, throughout that entire uh, uh, chain. Um, when you talk about things like potash and coal, um, bulk commodities like that, like, sure, you can, um, and in, in particular, when they're in transit, right, think about, you know, how commodity pricing changes, fluctuates, and perhaps even, you know, ownership changes and routes are diverted on stream. So that's another really neat use case for blockchain, too, right? And I, I think about that in terms of moving uh, things like oil. Um, so there's potential for it there. You need to ask yourself how much differentiation could matter in global markets, uh, whether or not you want to embark on a project like that, right? So is there something around potash or coal um, by either uh, what can you prove about your particular production that's going to differentiate it and actually uh, allow you to capture more share? Um, very. That, that's a short answer to a complex question. So if we do want to talk more about that, we certainly can. Awesome. Well, I'm sure you all have more questions than you have uh, answers to, but hopefully we uh, uh, got you guys engaged and, and you enjoyed the presentation today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Our next webinar will be uh, cross-border supply chain strategies. Um, we'll be coming out to market with some announcements in terms of timing and uh, content for that, so stay tuned. Um, and uh, past that, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, follow up by email, either with your uh, Perlator representative uh, or the men previously mentioned email, that's uh, david.bustle at perlator.com. You'll see an email in your uh, inbox for that. We'll be sh uh, following up today with uh, either today or tomorrow with the, uh, uh, um, a copy of the presentation as well as the slide deck. Uh, you will receive that by email. Um, again, if you have any questions, follow up. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much.